In the second video on equilibria, we're going to look at changing the equilibrium position. So, why do we want to shift the equilibrium position? Well, we talked about this at the end of the last lecture, but I'll just review it. Here's two different reactions. In the left hand one, at equilibrium, we've got quite a lot of product and just a little bit of reactant left over. Whereas, in this reaction, we've got lots of reactants and very little product. So, in this situation, we haven't really got as much product as we want. So, it'd be very beneficial to make the process viable if we can increase the amount of product. I'm going to learn the different ways in which we might be able to do that for any given reaction. And we're going to use the Chatelier's principle. This underpins all the changes we can make. And it states that if a system which is in equilibrium is subjected to a change in conditions, like temperature or pressure, the system will react in such a way as to reduce the effect of that change. So for example, if we increase the temperature, it will time to bring the temperature back down again. So, the first way in which we can manipulate the equilibrium position is by changing the concentration of reactants or products. So, for most of this lecture we'll just work with this random reversible reaction. And let's just say that the desired product one more time to make is D. Okay. So when we're at equilibrium, we haven't got as much D as we'd like. So how can we shift the equilibrium in favour of making more D? We're using the Chatelier's principle, okay. and we'll use an analogy of a seesaw. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's useful. So here's our reactants A and B, perfectly balanced by our reactants C and D. Now in this analogy, we're assuming that the concentrations are equal. Of course, at equilibrium, that's not necessarily the case. But let's just assume that in this particular situation, at equilibrium, the concentrations A and B are the same as the concentrations of C and D. Right, so if we knock this out of equilibrium, the Chatelier says it's going to try and re-establish equilibrium. So if we add more A, seesaw will go down. And the only way to get back up to equilibrium is for some A and B to react together to produce more C and D. So that will increase the amount of D. So adding more A, in this case, will increase the amount of our desired product. Adding more B will have the exact same effect. When we add more B, seesaw goes down. So some A and B must react to give more C and D to bring it back up. Or we could remove some C. Okay. So again, if we remove C, again, seesaw will go down this side. So some A and B must react to give some more C and D to bring it back up level. And similarly, if we remove some D, some more A and B will react to give you more C and D. Now, adding more A and adding more B are very straightforward. You just pour in some more. But how do you remove C or D? That's a bit more tricky. Now, there's two possible ways we can do it. We do it by a physical separation. Most normally this would be by removing a gas by liquefying it. And uh, we'll cover that later on when we look at the Haber process in a wee bit more detail. Or we could remove it by chemical separation. And there's a couple of ways we can do the chemical separation. And I want to look at them now. Right, the first way is by neutralisation. So, if one of our products is a hydrogen ion and we add a base, for example, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, adding some hydroxide ions, the hydroxide ions will react with the hydrogen ions to form water, hence removing H plus ions, and so more A and B will react to replace the H plus ions producing D as well at the same time. 
and it worked the other way around. If our product, one of our products was a hydroxide ion, we could add some H plus ions by adding any acid, hydrochloric, sulfuric, hydrochloric. H plus ions react to the OH minus ions, producing water, reducing the concentration of this, so more E and B react. So if you've got H plus or H minus ions in your equation, also look out for the neutralization. Another way of reducing the concentration of something is by precipitation. So say this was my uh, reversible reaction, I tried to make more D. So we know if we can remove these chloride ions, more E and B will react to replace them and produce more D. So if we can find something that will precipitate out chloride ions, that will work. So if you look at the solubility table in your data book, look up uh, the chloride. Most chlorides are soluble. One exception here, silver chloride is soluble. So if I add silver ions, you react with chloride ions to produce silver chloride solid and uh, that will reduce the Cl minus ions in the solution so more A and B will react. You need to add the silver in the soluble form and one choice is here, silver nitrate, that's soluble so you can add silver nitrate and you precipitate out silver chloride. Okay, so let's just look at a few questions you could be asked. So state the effect on the equilibrium of adding each of the following. So sodium chloride. Now, I think you should always go through it and check whether or not any of the ions here are present in the solution. It's sodium chloride, you have to have Na plus ions and Cl minus ions. There's no Na plus ions, but we have got some Cl minus ions. So adding sodium chloride would increase the concentration of Cl minus ions, so the equilibrium would shift to the left to remove them. Okay, so equilibrium position would shift to the left. If we added sodium hydroxide, so adding any plus ions and hydroxide ions. Well, neither of these ions appear in the equation. So next thing, look for neutralization. Well, hydroxide ions can react to the H plus ions, removing the H plus ions, so the echelon will shift to the right to replace them. So this would shift right. What happened when we added silver nitrate? We're adding silver ions and nitrate ions. Adding silver ions and nitrate ions. Well, the silver ions would react with chloride ions, produce silver chloride, removing chloride ions, so the equilibrium shifts right to replace them. So once again, it would shift right. And finally, sulfuric acid. So we add sulfuric acid, we're adding H plus ions and sulfate ions. So H plus ions appear in the equation there. Not neutralization in this case, it's not hydroxide ions removing these. So we're just adding more H plus ions, so the equilibrium will shift to the left to remove the excess H plus ions, so it would shift left. Okay. So it can be quite complicated, so make sure you can understand each of those questions. Okay, let's move on now to changing pressure. And to know how pressure will affect our reaction, we have to know the state symbols. So we've got 2A gas plus B solid reacting to get 4C aqueous plus D gas. Now, if we increase the pressure of this system, the echelon will shift to the side with fewer moles of gas. 
fewer moles of gas, not just fewer moles. So on this side, the reactants, two moles of gas, and this is a solid, so two moles of gas. Whereas on this side, we've got four moles of solution, one mole of gas. So if we increase the pressure, in order to decrease the pressure, it shifts to the side with a few moles of gas, which should be this side. So in this case, it would shift to the right because there's fewer moles of gas on the right hand side. And the opposite, if we decrease the pressure, the system tries to increase the pressure again, so it shifts to the side with more moles of gas. So it would shift to the left. Two things worth noting, if you've got the same number of moles of gas on both sides of the equation, changing the pressure will have no effect on the position of equilibrium. And also, if a gas is involved, equilibrium will only be reached if it's carried out in a sealed container. If it's an open container, then you're continually losing the gas and the equilibrium would never be reached. Okay, what about changing temperature? Okay. So, if you're given an equation like this, the delta H value of minus 80 refers to the forward reaction. So minus 80 is an exothermic reaction, and the reverse reaction would be plus 80, so it's endothermic the reverse reaction. So, if we increase the temperature, the system tries to reduce the temperature again. So it will favour the reaction which removes heat, the endothermic reaction, one with positive delta H. So if we increase the temperature of this reaction, it will shift to the left. And if we decrease the temperature, it will try to increase the temperature by favouring the exothermic reaction, so it will shift to the right. Uh, catalyst and equilibrium. So two points to be aware of. Firstly, catalyst does not affect the position of equilibrium. If you end up with 80% product, 20% reactant, you'll still get that same equilibrium whether or not you use a catalyst or not. Where a catalyst is useful is that it speeds up the time it takes for equilibrium to be reached, but it speeds up both the forward and reverse reaction. So for example, if this is a reaction without a catalyst, if we did it with a catalyst, we still end up with this amount of the blue, but we'd get there faster. And we'd still end up with the same amount of red, but we'd get there faster. Okay. So we reach equilibrium faster, which is always good. Okay, so let's just look how that plays out for a real life example of the HEMA process. Okay, so the HEMA process we use a catalyst, we use an iron catalyst. Okay. Because doesn't increase the amount of NH3, but we reach the equilibrium point faster, and producing it fast is usually good in the industry. What about pressure? Well, how many moles of gas on both sides? One, four, we've got four moles of gas on this side, two moles of gas on this side. So. If we have a high pressure, if we increase the pressure, the equilibrium will shift to the right to reduce the pressure. And we want the equilibrium to the right because ammonia is our desired product. 
So we use a high pressure. How high we go just depends on the cost of the reaction vessel that can withstand that pressure. That's the limiting factor on how high the pressure is. Temperature's a wee bit more tricky. Okay, minus 92, so forward reaction is exothermic, the reverse is endothermic. So to favour the production of ammonia, we want to reduce the temperature, we want a low temperature. The only problem with low temperature is, although it will increase the amount of ammonia we produce, it, again it slows down the rate at which it's produced, it will take longer to reach equilibrium at a low temperature. So we'll end up with a bit of a compromise between having a high enough yield and a fast enough re uh, reaction. So can I use a moderate temperature? And finally, in order to push the reaction to the right, we try and remove the ammonia as it's been produced. And we can do this by cooling it down to minus 35 degrees, which liquefies the ammonia, but not the reactants. So we can continuously remove NH3 uh, by, condens by condensing, and that shifts the equilibrium to the right. So we condense the NH3 into a liquid NH3. Okay, so four things you must be able to do. Predict and explain how changing the concentration of reactants or products can affect the equilibrium position. Okay. Predict and explain how changing the pressure can affect the equilibrium position. Predict and explain how changing the temperature can affect the equilibrium position and recall the effect of the catalysts on equilibrium.